Which impending free agents will the New York Mets run it back with in 2025? We'll talk about it on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Down the Game Time app, create an account. Use the code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. All right, off season time. We are now more than 24 hours removed from the end of the Mets season. Still stings a little bit. I'm not going to lie. I spent my Monday morning. I don't know about you, uh, but I was up super late uh, after the Mets loss and, you know, first producing the show. Then I spent a bunch of time just looking through the roster and, as the obsessed Met sicko I am, I started just kind of throwing together a list of topics. That's the one good thing about the off season is you can kind of, you know, look at things ahead of time. You're not as reactionary to the news of the day and really can plan out some interesting things to discuss throughout this off season. So I did have a long list of topics and we're, we're starting today with who the Mets might run it back with next year, because there's a lot of emotion tied to, to a lot of these impending free agents, guys that, you want to see back in a Mets uniform and others that you might be ready to say goodbye to. And so that's what we're going to do throughout the show today. And I want to start things off with the impending free agents that I believe will not be back with the Mets next year. These are guys that I just don't see a need for next year. And I really don't think the Mets will pursue them that heavily at all. When it comes to the free agency, they'll thank them for their time this season and move on. So we're going to open things up with the last free agent the Mets signed last offseason. That's J.D. Martinez. I do not believe he will be back next year under any circumstance. I think the Mets are going to look at their team. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next segment as well. When we get to guys that could come back. And I think they're going to see a real chance to get some youth movement to, to rise to the surface and help an offense that was already great this year and doesn't need too much to be put over the top. The Mets lineup is not why they got eliminated. They got eliminated because they didn't have enough pitching. I think that's where the bigger focus has to be this offseason. Now that you have Mark Vientos in place as a budding star, you have Lindor, you have Nimmo, you have Marte and Taylor coming back, you have Jeff McNeil is going to be part of the equation, and then you have all these prospects. We saw Acuna make his debut, Ronnie Mauricio will be healthy, there's still Brett Beatty, not really a prospect anymore, but still a young player that might factor into your core. You got Drew Gilbert. You got Jet Williams. There's a lot of options. So I look at the DH spot in the Mets roster, and I think they would be wise to keep that relatively open. Now, we'll talk about Jesse Winker in the next segment. I think he is the perfect guy to be your opening day DH, so to speak, where he could be your DH. He could move into right field. He can move into left field. There's some flexibility there. I don't think it makes sense to roster a DH only. And that is what JD Martinez is at this stage of his career. And you look at the season he had, he had 235, 320 on base, 406 slug, 726 OPS. Those are a far cry from his numbers last year. And he did it 16 home runs. He did drive in 69, but overall, The offensive production was not there for J.D. Martinez. It really tailed off. He did not homer in his final 86 plate appearances from the regular season through the playoffs. No home runs. So he didn't homer at all in September. Uh, His last home run was August 30th and then didn't homer at all in, in October. 37 years old next season. He reminded me a little bit, and I made this comp on the show before, of Michael Kadire in 2015 where you just start to see, oh, yeah, this guy's on his way out. And I actually do believe JD Martinez could sign somewhere next year, but I think even he would admit that it's not a guarantee when he was asked about his future and they asked what he's going to do. He said, he's going to play a lot of pickleball, you know? So I think JD Martinez might even be thinking about the end. He said, he's going to you know work to get his body, um, you know, ready to potentially go, but he said it has to be worth it for him to play. 
So who's going to pay him enough money to, to bring him back for another season? Is there a winning situation he can go to? It's possible. I just don't think it's going to be with the New York Mets. I thought he was a great player for them this year. His role as a leader and a pseudo hitting coach was very valuable to this team. But should the Mets invest money and clog a DH spot for him? I do not think they should. So I think he will be gone next season. The other guy when it comes to the position players that I think won't be back is Harrison Bader. Prior to the All-Star break, Harrison Bader hit 273, 312 on base, 410 slug, had a 732 OPS. Post-All-Star break, he had 167, 230 on base, 283 slug, a 513 OPS. Now, if Harrison Bader was in the room making a case for himself, he'd probably say, well, look, I didn't get consistent playing time in the second half, but that's a chicken and egg situation. Was it the lack of playing time that led to the lack of results, or did the lack of results lead to the lack of playing time? Regardless, when the Mets signed Harrison Bader, and I was wrong at the time, but I did not like the signing, and the reason I didn't like it is because the Mets had already traded for Tyrone Taylor, and I thought there were two players that had very similar skill sets. Tyrone Taylor is the guy that will be on the roster next year. He's under contract. He's in arbitration for the next two seasons. It's not going to cost a lot of money. He's going to be your fourth outfielder. Harrison Bader should not be your starting center fielder. It should be, and the offset may be Tyrone Taylor, but that's a position that could either go to a young player like a Drew Gilbert, like a Jet Williams, like a Luis and Helicuna, or if you are really aggressive in the market and you sign some corner outfielders, it could go back to Brandon Nimmo, but I don't think that it should be Harrison Bader next season. So I think Bader is going to sign elsewhere. Now there's two other players that I think will most likely be gone. The first one is Adam Adovino. We saw what happened this year. He was not the same guy he was back in 2022 when he was at his best in a Mets uniform. He's had his moments the last couple of years, but I feel like the time has passed on Adam Adovino. I think he maybe wants to go to a different team, potentially, uh, where he might get more opportunities to, to pitch and leverage. He didn't really get those this year because he didn't really earn them. Um, with that said, I wouldn't rule it out entirely because he did come back to the Mets last year. I think he does like pitching in New York as a local guy, but I think Adam Adovino has played his last game as a Met. Another one when it comes to the relievers that I think is most likely gone, and I'm a little bit surprised to say this, but I think Phil Maton's not coming back. And the reason why I'm surprised is because when the Mets traded for him, we saw that club option that he has and thought, all right, you kind of have a guy that could pitch for you for not just the rest of 2024, but all of 2025. The more I looked at reliever contracts, though, and I looked at Maton's option, which is $7.75 million. And you look at the relievers that are going to hit the market. I don't know if you necessarily want to commit $7.75 million to Phil Maton on the absolute offset of free agency. You're going to have to pick up that option right away here. You can't just wait on it and sit on it. He's got to have the ability to go out and shop deals if he's not going to come back to the Mets. It's got a $250,000 buyout to it. So essentially you have to decide, is it worth signing Phil Maton to $7.5 million because 250K is going to be lost either way. You look at last year's free agent class, Craig Kimbrell got 13 million on a one-year deal. Rollis Chapman got 10 and a half. Liam Hendricks got 10 million. Hector Norris got 9 million. Chris Stratton got eight. Joe Kelly got eight. And then it was Jacob Junis, who's kind of a swing man at seven. Maton at six and a half. That's where he fell in last year. I don't know if he earned a million dollar raise, so to speak, where his market would be worth $7.5 million. He was very good for the Mets in the regular season, a 2.51 ERA. But in the playoffs, he had an 8.53 ERA. Gio Bruns in four of his six playoff appearances. I think the question you have to ask yourself, and that the front office might ask themselves, who would you rather pay $7.5 million to next year to have them come back? Bill Maton or Ryan Stanek? I think the answer would be Ryan Stanek, but Stanek only signed a $4 million deal in free agency last year. So there's a chance you could even get Stanek back for less. At this point, I would waive that, that or I, would, I would take the buyout on that club option, let Maton hit free agency. There's a chance he could return, but who knows where the Mets are going to go with relievers. So I believe the guys from the 2024 Mets that will not be back in 2025, J.D. Martinez, Harrison Bader, Phil Maton, and Adam Adovino. 
Now, the others are up for debate, and that's where we're going to go next. Which position players will the Mets run it back with? We'll go through the names in just a minute. First, though, quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. And Game Time has Game Time picks that will make it easier for you to get tickets to your favorite live events because they're going to filter out the fluff and show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets and more with Game Time Picks. Down the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Lockdown MLB. You're going to get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem the code Lockdown MLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. Stay up today with all the latest in the world of sports when you check out Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Our goal is to get to 11,000 subscribers by the end of the postseason. Mets aren't in it anymore, though. But, hey, there's still two weeks left, so I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. All right, so now there's three more players to talk about who will hit free agency from the Mets playoff roster. You got Jesse Winker. You got Jose Iglesias, and you got Pete Alonso. Now, Alonso is going to require a ton of discussion throughout this offseason. I have gone back and forth on this. I was always firmly in the camp of bring Pete Alonso back. A year and two months ago, <laughs> after the trade deadline in 2023, when I laid out the five things the Mets needed to do to become real contenders, the first one was hire David Stearns. The second one was extend Pete Alonso. I've always believed that Pete Alonso should retire. New York Mets should get that home run record. This year, I wavered, though. This year, there was moments where I thought, maybe it's not that locked in stone. But, and again, future podcast topic, I believe Pete Alonso delivered so much on the biggest stage and proved that he was still a very tough at bat that could change playoff games with that powerful swing, that I would bring him back, no questions asked. Honestly, just to remove the angst from it, if it if it was my team, my way, I would love it if the Mets took that negotiating window, just like they did with Edwin Diaz after the 2022 season, and they just hammered out a contract right now. Now, Scott Boris being Pete Alonso's agent, likely not going to see that happen. But I also don't think that fans should overreact too much to Boris being his agent Because Pete Alonso still wants to be a Met. I think Steve Cohen wants Pete Alonso to be a Met. And Scott Boris is going to broker those discussions, of course. It might take a lot of time. I still believe that Pete Alonso will be back in a Mets uniform. And I don't think that Alonso's free agency is necessarily tied to Juan Soto's, other than the fact that Soto's might play out first. But... I think the Mets could sign Soto and still sign Alonzo. You could have Pete Alonzo still be your first baseman of the future, or if you want to, you can have Pete Alonzo be your DH of the future. Either way, I think Pete's coming back, but it is definitely up in the air. Now, the other two are interesting. Jesse Winker, tale of two seasons sort of with the Mets. In the regular season, he was good, but really not great. Hit 243, 318 on base, 365 slug, 683 OPS in 44 games. That is below average. In the playoffs, he was arguably the Mets' best hitter. 318 average, 531 on base, 636 slug, 1.167 OPS. Now, actually, let me just couch this a little bit. By OPS, he was the Mets' best hitter because it was a more limited sample size than guys like Mark Miantos, Francisco Lindor, and Pete Alonso. And he got on base at a 531 clip, which is insane. Mark Vientos, I would probably crown as the Mets' best hitter this October. And then I would say maybe it was Alonzo next just because of the big home runs and Lindor right there. But they had a lot of good hitters, and Jesse Winker was certainly one of them. Question is, do you bring him back? Do you buy into what Jesse Winker did this year? And what kind of market does Jesse Winker get to enjoy in free agency? You look at some of the other free agents that are of a similar caliber. There's the Mark Hanna, Michael Conforto, Alex Verdugo, Tommy Pham, Adam Duvall class that I think he sort of belonged to. I think he's the best one out of that grouping. 
Then you have Jerks and Profar off of an unbelievable season. Tyler O'Neill, who was really good when healthy. Those guys, I think, get paid more than Jesse Winker, particularly Profar. But I don't imagine he stays in San Diego because of how well he has fit there. You have Teoscar Hernandez and Anthony Santander. They're going to get longer deals for more money for sure. We could talk about their free agency at some point. But I think Jesse Winker makes a lot of sense because I don't think you have to give him some multi-year contract. I think you can probably get him back on a healthy one-year deal. I think it makes a lot of sense to bring Jesse Winker back, especially if you do leave that DH spot open where Winker could be your DH. He could be your right fielder. He could be your left fielder. You just sort of see how the season plays out. You can sort of look at Winker and Marte and the availability of players who are a little bit further along in their career. I think Winker should be healthy, but you know, Marte, I don't think you can expect much more than at best 110 games as Darling Marte. I think he's going to have his injuries. So getting Jesse Winker into the fold just gives you that contingency plan for Marte, gives you a lefty bat that you really trust what he's going to do in the box. You trust his discipline. He's got some pop. I think Jesse Winker stands a decent shot at coming back. It just depends on how high the Mets set the bar in free agency. Are they you know, dead set on keeping Alonzo, letting Alonzo walk? If they let Alonzo walk, are you – pursuing another first baseman is Mark Vantos your first baseman it, it, there's a lot that goes into the, the mass free agent plans but I, I think overall I look at this team and, and like I said because you have youth movement coming and, and you still have a core in place I don't think the Mets have to reinvent the wheel offensively I think they should absolutely pursue Juan Soto with everything they have because he can change your franchise for a decade I think there will be conversations to be had about big bats like a Teoscar Hernandez, like an Anthony Santander that we will have later on throughout this offseason. But if you're looking at the outfield market, I think bringing Jesse Winker back, keeping some continuity from a group that really excelled together, I don't think that that's a bad thing at all. So I think the Mets should absolutely pursue him in free agency. And the last guy is Jose Iglesias, which is the absolute epitome of the continuity from this year. And the, the magic came when Jose Iglesias came to the Mets. And OMG signs will be around the ballpark next year, probably with or without Iglesias, but definitely more so with him. And I think it makes a lot of sense to bring him back. But I, throughout the season, and even up to yesterday, was saying he's going to be back. The more I looked at it and thought about it, it's not as definite as I was maybe suggesting it would be. He did hit 337 this year. Uh, career high, I believe. That's, I think, 2020. It might have been a little bit higher. 829 OPS. Again, 2020 in a shortened sample. He had a monster season. But other than that, definitely a career high. And he outpaced his career OPS by, I believe, 100, over 100 points. I can all have it in front of me. I think it might have been 120 points. It might be a career 709 OPS guy. Let me actually see if I can pull that real quick. But regardless, when it comes to Jose Iglesias, I don't think you need to sign him to a multi-year deal for sure. He's going to be 35 years old. At times this year, I think I said, maybe you just give him a two-year contract to keep him around. I don't think you do that. I think probably one year, four or five million, you could probably get him back. I don't know if other teams are going to view this season where he hit 337 and think we want him to be our starting second baseman. I think they're going to look at this as more of a flash in the pan, similar to how I think other teams might view the Mets season in general, which isn't fair to Iglesias or the Mets. But when you're talking about the market, I don't think the market's going to dictate Iglesias getting multiple years or even much more than a $5 million contract based on what other free agents signed for last offseason. So with that said, if you were to approach Iglesias, even in this window when you can negotiate with your own players and you just put in front of them a $4 million guaranteed contract for 2025, he might just sign on the dotted line. I think he loves playing in New York that much. He might make more when it comes to selling records anyway. So I think Iglesias in some way stands the best chance to come back just because I don't think his free agency will get out of hand where like Jesse Winker, some team might talk themselves into Jesse Winker at, I don't know, 14, $15 million. And maybe the Mets view his market or view his value at 10, whatever it is. Pete Alonzo, of course, could have a very healthy market. 
I think Iglesias probably comes back to the Mets, but the reason why I wouldn't say it's as guaranteed as I thought it was even a day ago is because I started to look at the infield situation for the Mets. And let's say you bring Pete Alonso back. Got Alonso at first, Vientos at third, McNeil and Lindor up the middle. Now, another future podcast topic, should the Mets bring back Jeff McNeil or Jose Iglesias? As in, should they eat money and try to trade Jeff McNeil's contract? We might talk about that. That is on my list of potential future shows. But I think Jeff McNeil is going to be back. I, I think that the contract, it doesn't make sense to eat a contract when he can still provide value for you. And he showed enough in the second half that I think he can still provide that value, especially with his versatility. But Jeff McNeil, he can be your right fielder, your left fielder, or your second baseman. Jose Iglesias, you're looking at second, short, and third. And really, it should just be second base as far as um, his primary position. Now, you look at the other options, right? So let's say, again, Alonzo McNeil, Lindor, Vientos. Well, now if you're building out the rest of your roster and you say you have, all right, Nemo, Marte, Tyrone Taylor, Jesse Winker, Francisco Alvarez, Luis Torrens. That's 10 guys if you were to sign Alonzo and Winker. You have three more spots. You have Brett Beatty. You have Luis and Helicuna. You have Ronnie Mauricio. You have Drew Gilbert. You have Jet Williams. And when you're thinking about the infield, would you rather have Jose Iglesias on the opening day roster or Luis and Helicuna? That's sort of the dilemma that I think the front office is going to have. Should they bring back a 35-year-old utility infielder for a guaranteed contract when they might be able to find the next Jose Iglesias in free agency on a minor league deal that they can stash in Syracuse until they need them? I think Iglesias, because of what he meant to this team, is going to come back, though. Ultimately, I'm just not as positive as I was right when the season ended. I was like, how could you not bring him back? The case would be, we believe that Jet Williams and Luis and Helicuna will play a big role in our 2025 roster, and we want to leave some of those infield spots and opportunities open. But I think he comes back. Anyway, the final segment, we got three pitchers to discuss. The starting rotation that got you within two wins of the World Series. They didn't quite do enough, though. Are the Mets going to bring back any of Luis Severino, Sean Manaya, and Jose Quintana? We'll go through in just a minute. First, though, another word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get the hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, your live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets guaranteed, win or lose. So maybe you like the Dodgers to win the World Series. Throw $5 on that. You're getting $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Win or lose. That's at FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. If you're an everyday listener of the show, make sure you become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where I get updates from me anytime news breaks in the Mets. You can ask me questions anytime. You can also take part in our Locked On Mets sign photo giveaways and get a line of graphic sent to your phone. Oh, there is no line of graphic. Ah, you will get the line of graphic next year. Isn't that sad? But you're still going to get your updates. Uh, and I'll also do some other exclusive insider content. As I really start to dive into free agency, I typically do my research before I do these shows, and I'll send some of that research, some of those notes that I'll have to the insiders before the shows come out. So if you want to be a Locked on Mets insider throughout the offseason, make sure you become a Locked on Mets insider through the link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash Locked on Mets. All right, so let's talk about the Mets starting rotation next year. Kodai Senga. I believe he's going to be back. He's going to be healthy. You can't go into the offseason assuming he's going to get hurt again. So he's your ace. David Peterson is currently your number two under contract. Paul Blackburn should factor into the rotation. Tyler McGill will be in the mix. I think Jose Budo will go into camp, get stretched out to be a starting pitcher, and then we'll see if he can win a job. You got Brandon Sprout, your top prospect or your top pitching prospect. I had him number one on my most recent top 10 of the Mets system. I think you got to not necessarily pencil him into the opening day rotation, but I would expect he makes starts next year for sure. Technically, if you wanted to, you could still tender Joey Lucchese a contract again, and he'd be in his final year of arbitration. I think he probably gets non-tendered if I had to guess, because at one point he was off the roster. He was added to the roster again just to pitch in that doubleheader at the end of the season. 
You have Mike Vassell. You have Dom Hamill. You have Blade Tidwell. Those are your, uh, you know, top prospects that are in AAA right now. Uh, Vassell and Hamill. I'm getting less and less confident that they will be much more than swingmen in the big leagues. Guys that can go from the rotation to the bullpen. I don't know if they necessarily have much more of a high ceiling other than a fifth starter. I do think Hamill's got some interesting characteristics where he might profile up in the bullpen. We'll talk about that another time. Blade Tidwell, I still have some faith in. Bottom line, there's more starting pitching depth here than you might think. I don't believe the Mets have to go into this offseason and replace all of Severino, Manai, and Quintana. I really think they only have to add two starting pitchers. I think they'll be fine because I think David Peterson is locked in as sort of your three starter or four starter. Kodai Senga is one frontline starter. And I believe if you go into spring and your fifth starter is a competition between Blackburn, McGill, and Budo, I think you're fine. So I really believe you only need two free agent signings and you just have to pick the right two. So throughout the offseason, we'll talk about, oh, should the Mets get Corbin Burns or Max Freed? Some of those top free agents, Blake Snell, all those guys that are going to be on the market. When it comes to your free agents, you could just say, eh, Severino and Manaya were pretty good. Let's just run it back with them. Sean Manaya this year, 347 ERA, 181 and two third innings pitch, 184 strikeouts, 1.08 whip. And that whip got even better in the second half. It was below one for a large stretch of the season. It was probably even more than half the season. I think it was his last 19 starts off the top of my head. He had the best batting average against in Major League Baseball, was not giving up hits. I think he proved that he can be a frontline starting pitcher. He'll be 33 years old. I don't know how crazy the market gets for Sean Manaya, but in my opinion, if there's one of the three guys that Matt should run it back with, it's Manaya. Severino is the guy that I think they should let walk. Had a 391 ERA, 182 innings. That was amazing. 1.24 whip. He's younger. He's 31 years old. I think the fact that he's younger, he's going to get maybe even more years than Sean Manaya. I think Sevy might stumble into a four or five year contract, and I would not take that risk. I think he earned that. I think he deserves that, and I hope he gets that. I just don't think that that should come from the Mets. So if it was up to me, I'd let Severino walk. I would give him a qualifying offer. If he wants to come back and pitch on whatever it is this year, probably around $21 million. I haven't checked the exact number. By all means, one-year deals for starting pitchers are great. We just saw it work out with both of these guys, essentially. The Nyes was a one-plus-one. He could opt into his deal and do the Mets a massive favor. He won't. He should cash in. He will cash in. I would re-sign Sean Manaya, but the market could get crazy there. If Sean Manaya gets to a realm where – Per year, it's not drastically different than a Blake Snell. All of a sudden, it might get to a point where maybe the Mets don't want to buy the product that they made, so to speak. But I think there's actually a pretty decent chance Manaya comes back. Then you got Jose Quintana. Quintana will be 36 next season. 3.75 ERA this year was one point above his career ERA, which is 3.74. Did that in 170 in the third innings pitch. Talked about it all throughout the playoff run. He was lights out throughout September. Was great in his first couple playoff starts. Didn't do the best against the Dodgers, but that's a really tough team. Very tough matchup for him in particular. He had a 1-2-5 whip this year. Do you bring Jose Quintana back? I think you stay engaged with Quintana as long as you can, but I think there's more attractive options in a free agency. It's where I would go with it. And Here's my sort of example. Let's say Jose Quintana and Walker Bueller fall under a similar contract. This year, the reclamation one-year deals, Severino, Manaya, Flaherty, they clocked in around $14 million. That was the last free agency. Jose Quintana was making $13 million for the Mets. I think he probably has earned a similar payday this time. Will he get a two-year deal? I think that's up for debate. I think he maybe settles in at a one-year deal. Maybe it's a one-year deal with a club option potentially. Who knows? But I don't think Quintana is going to get two years. I think it's one year. And that's sort of the similar bucket you could be shopping in when it comes to the reclamation pitchers. If it was my money, while Quintana is the dependable arm when it comes to innings, 
I would take the upside of a Walker Bueller because Walker Bueller might be able to rediscover who he used to be or at least a better version of who he is now. And maybe Bueller can be a guy that turns in a Luis Severino-esque season. Now you'll say, well, Sevi didn't even necessarily have a better year than Jose Quintana. He did pitch 12 more innings or 11 and two thirds, but at a slightly higher ERA. As we watched them this year, which one seemed like the better pitcher? Was it Sevi or was it Quintana? I think it was Luis Severino. So in my opinion, if you were looking at that one-year deal type, I would get out a year early on Quintana instead of a year late, and I would see if you can find somebody else whose profile you like and you believe Jeremy Hefner can get the most out of, get the most out of with your pitching lab, and I would go that route. So maybe you get your bona fide ace. If it is the top of the market, the Corbin Burns of the world, the Max Freed, or even Sean Maniah that's sort of in that tier B, then you maybe get a reclamation starter, or maybe you get two sort of tier B starters, Manaya and somebody else. It, it could be Manaya and Quintana, Manaya and Severino, but I think the Mets have to try to get a little bit better at their rotation this offseason. I think Kodai Senga is going to be a huge lift next year, and Sean Manaya and Kodai Senga could be your two frontline guys. I honestly believe if they were to sign Manaya and Bueller, I'd be fine with the Mets rotation. I really would. If it was Senga, Manaya, Peterson, Bueller, Blackburn, McGill, Buda with Brandon Sprout looming as a guy that could shoot up and he has frontline stuff. I think the Mets might be okay with just doing that, but they're going to have negotiations with all these guys. I think Seve and Manaya both get the qualifying offer. I think both of them hit the market. I think that the qualifying offer could hinder both of their markets a little bit as well. And maybe one of them falls back to the Mets, but I would prefer that to be Sean Manaya. I had to run it back with any of the Mets and pending free agents. The guys that I would identify as the ones the Mets should run it back with, I think they should re-sign Sean Manaya, Pete Alonso, Jesse Winker, and Jose Iglesias, and also potentially Ryan Stanek. But I think with relievers, it's just go out and do the best you can, find the best stuff possible, and it's very hard to predict the reliever market. So I don't have a strong sort of inclination that Stanek will definitely be back for any other reason than he's a good pitcher and he's one of the relievers available, but I wouldn't even say it's more likely that they sign Ryan Stanek than I don't know, Andrew Chafin, whoever else is in the market. I, I just think he's a good reliever that I'd like to see back. Anyway, that's going to be all for this edition of locked on Mets. I don't know if we'll delay the Pete Alonso conversation any longer. I did it today a little bit. I talked about it, but I want to give Pete Alonso his full show. So tomorrow we're going to do that sort of a season recap free agency preview. Make sure you check that out. If you are listening on the audio side, follow rate review, wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you want to follow me on social media, you can do so at Finkelstein Ryan, follow the show at Locked on Mets. Thank you for making Locked on Mets. Your first listener, your first watch every day. Now for your second watch, head over to YouTube and check out the first ever 24 seven streaming channel that covers everything. The world of sports. Find my locked on sports today with our local host from each team. League-wide hosts from each league by Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube.